Hello, Betty Crow back again with the table rankings for Pinball Arcade Season 6. Now, some people I know were asking for this video. In fact, some people were asking for it even before Season 6 was over. And I've been taking my time making this video, but here it is, finally. Now, uh, Season 6 consisted of 12 tables that were delivered in 11 table packs. All the tables were sold individually, except for Jack's Open and Centigrade 37, which were sold as a bundle. And incidentally, Jack's Open and Centigrade 37 were the only two electromechanical tables that were released this season. Now, Season 6 heavily relies on Gottlieb tables, and 7 of the 12 of them have the Gottlieb name if you include the Elvin G table. And also interesting is that there's only one Williams table included in the season. Another oddity from this season is the inclusion of a Farsight Studio original table that was created in the form of the Doctor Who Master of Time table, which is an altered version of the Doctor Who table from Bally. Now, speaking of rankings, just as before, there's no formula or anything I used to rank the table. I just played them and then ordered them. It's totally just my opinion based on playing the Steam version of the game. The only problem I have with making these lists is that I can't change them because over time I've had a change of heart on some tables that I've ranked in previous seasons. But I guess there's very little I could do about that. Anyway, let's get on with it. All aboard the crazy train. Number 12, Doctor Who, Master of Time. Before I even started this list, I knew which table I was going to be putting at the bottom. And I think quite a few of you will agree that this table belongs at the bottom of the list. This table is probably my least favorite table in Pimba Arcade overall. Farsight Studios had frequently turned to Kickstarter to help pay for licensing for certain tables, and Bally's Doctor Who is one of those tables Kickstarter helped fund to get made. Now that Doctor Who table is one of my favorite tables, but it was made at a time in which there were only seven Doctors. Oh, and I'm sorry if you're not familiar with the Doctor Who TV show, but you'll just have to bear with me for the moment. So, in 2005, when Doctor Who was brought back to the air and the adventures had continued, there have been more Doctors, Companions, and Villains. So when Farsight Studios got the funding to do the Doctor Who table, they thought it would be a good idea to create a rethemed version of that table based on the more recent Doctor Who adventures, and thus this table was born. Now, I initially thought this table was going to be pretty much the same, only with different visuals and voice samples, but it's not. The basic layout of the original table is there, but the ball flow is just a little different, and there's an added flipper, and the time expander is replaced with just the TARDIS, and the Cybermen just appear out of nowhere, and I know what they were going for here, something that plays similarly to the original table, but it all feels wrong. The colorful play field has been replaced with an extremely dark one, and the playful audio of the original has been replaced with dark and moody music that feels like the table wants me to take the game way more seriously than I want to. The audio clips are crystal clear, but sound like they're just random clips taken from the show. And often they sound like they have nothing to do with what's actually going on. I don't want to spend too much time talking about this table and what a disappointment it is, but when I was playing it recently, it occurred to me how to sum up this table perfectly. It feels like a table that belongs in Pinball FX. Not Pinball FX 2. This feels like something that would have been done by Zen Studios in their first attempts at Pinball FX almost 10 years ago. Okay, enough of this table. Let's move on to entries that were actually based on real tables. It wasn't me who ran, Doctor. Fantastic! Number 11, Bone Busters, Inc. There is one main reason I'm ranking this table so low on the list, and that's because it's not very player friendly, especially for beginners. At least that's the way I feel about this table. The table seems very cramped and it's very difficult to figure out what to shoot for. The music and the audio aren't that bad, but it really doesn't help me in figuring out what to aim for. You just kind of have to figure everything out by trial and error. And not to forget about the flipper diverter at the top of the playfield that's activated by the third flipper button. One of the things I do like about this table though is the skill shot. Other than that I find that I get aggravated with this table because the ball seems to get drawn to the right and left out lanes fairly often. With no ball save time limit, it's often that I could launch the ball and lose it within 5 seconds. Now while I admit I could just plain suck at this table, it doesn't seem to happen as frequently on other tables as it does here. On top of that, as of this video, there are still obvious bugs in this table that Farsight still hasn't taken care of. 
The coin taker plate still has the wrong texture on it, and oftentimes when a game ends, no menu comes up, forcing you to bring up the menu and quit the game manually. I'll still play this table every now and again, but every time I do, I'm disappointed. And just for a quick bonus fun fact, Gottlieb originally wanted to make a table based on the Ghostbusters movie, but when that license fell through, they changed it to Bone Busters. And if you look at the table, the art and the toys and everything, it's fairly obvious that this was originally meant to be a Ghostbusters table. <laughs> Number 10, Frank Thomas Big Hurt. This is one of those tables I feel like I should like more than I actually do. I originally had this higher up on the list, but after I played it again, I dropped it a couple spots. The layout of the table has a few interesting tricks that look like I should enjoy, but ultimately it doesn't work out that way, and it all starts out with the skill shot. The ball is supposed to be fed to the upper flipper, which you are supposed to then flip to knock the ball into some drop targets. And I get what they were going for there, like the ball is being pitched to you, but sometimes the ball never even reaches your flipper, making it impossible to even get the skill shot. Now this is something I can't compare with the real table as I've never played it, but it does feel like something's off with the simulation. The main attraction of this table has got to be the moving glove that attempts to catch the balls as you attempt to hit the ball up the ramp for a hit or even a home run. During some situations, the center ramp will lift up, allowing for a home run without the glove's interference, and that's something I thought would be pretty cool, but ultimately it's not enough to keep me interested. There are only a couple shots to start the game modes, and they all seem to use the same music, and everything just seems to be repeated far too often. It can sometimes be confusing what the game wants you to do at times as well. It could tell you to shoot the orbit, and then three seconds later tell you to hit center field. Then the mode deactivates before I even get control of the ball. Maybe I'm just poor at playing this table, but it always seems like I stop playing this one out of frustration. Number 9, Center Grade 37. This is one of two EM tables this season, and it was very difficult for me to figure out where to place them on the list. I know some people don't like EM tables because how simple they are compared with solid state tables, especially solid state tables released in the late 80s onward. But occasionally I like to play these EM tables, like Senate Grade 37, because it can be a very relaxed game of pinball, and that's exactly what you get here. Once you figure out what to shoot for, this table can be a breeze because there is a very low risk of losing the ball, especially if your nudging skills are on par. The only real problem can be the left out lane, but other than that, just the occasional mistake will cause you to lose the ball. I guess that's the reason I've placed this one lower on the list, it's just that the table doesn't feel that challenging, but don't get me wrong, it can be enjoyable if you're in the right mood. Number 8, Jack's Open. This is the other EM table this season, and just about everything I said about Santa Great 37 is true for this table as well. So the question is, why did I rank Jack's Open higher than Santa Great 37? Well, I happen to think that Jack's Open is just a little bit more interesting than Santa Great 37. The goal of this table is to collect certain cards as represented by a long row of drop targets near the middle of the table. The first objective is to collect two jacks, so you can knock down as many targets as you want, but once you knock down the two jacks, the targets reset and you're on to your next goal, three queens. The game continues until you reach the final goal, which simply repeats until the game is over. The outlanes are set up in such a way that it's almost impossible for the balls to drain, but regardless, the table does present a challenge in the speed of the ball and the likelihood you will often lose control constantly shooting for the center drop targets. For these reasons, I feel I had to put Jack's open just a notch above centigrade 37. Number 7, 8 Ball Deluxe. Quit talking and start chalking. These are the words that greet you the moment you start playing 8 Ball Deluxe. This table from 1980 has limited phrases, but it puts them to good use, informing the player where they need to direct the ball. This is a simple game as well. 
There are seven drop targets representing seven billiard balls, and the main goal, first and foremost, is to hit all of those drop targets, and then hit the eight ball drop target in the corner, and basically repeat. There are also four rollover targets to go for as well, though I never like it when a shot I need to aim for is in the in lane. So I have a tendency to ignore those and just take them as it comes. As much as I like the simplicity of this table, it's the same simplicity and repetitiveness that prevents me from ranking this table any higher. One more for Deluxe. One more for Deluxe. <laughs> Rack him up. Number six, Al's Garage Band goes on a world tour. This is one of those tables I have a few problems with, but at the end of the day, it still manages to be fun. The first issue I have happens right when you launch the ball. Every time, the ball is fed onto the playfield in such a way that it has a good chance of going right in between the flippers unless you nudge. It really seems like a design flaw, as it seems like a cheap shot whenever this does happen. The game does have a few modes which has you trying to accomplish something completely different. One of the problems I have with these game modes is the fact that it doesn't seem to clearly indicate what you're supposed to be shooting for. It's something I had to look up in the instructions, and I don't think something as basic as that should have to be looked up. For example, one of the modes is Rock and Ramps, which is confusing since there's only one ramp on the table and it's not lit during the mode. Well, unless I'm missing something. After looking it up, yes, indeed that ramp is supposed to be hit, but then you realize the spinning disc is a ramp as well. And yes, it makes sense, but it doesn't seem like it's a ramp if you're a beginner on the table. There's plenty of things like that on this table where you wish it was just a little clearer sometimes what you need to be doing overall, but I still manage to have a good time on this table. I like the layout, and the spinning CD ramp can be a bit frustrating to hit sometimes, but I also feel it's a good challenging shot, especially during multiball. The one thing I really have to knock this table for is the absolutely horrible video mode. All you do is pound on the flippers as fast as you can for 10 seconds. It's not challenging, it's pretty annoying, and it comes up way too frequently for my tastes. I mean, this is pinball, not Konami's track and field. I should rank this table lower just because of that, but I think it's fine where it is. Number 5, Gladiators. This table has a lot of things going for it. The playfield is nice and colorful and has some very cool art on it, and the table layout is pretty unique but still fun to play, well once you get used to it. And the music and audio is the first thing that will hit you when you start playing. The music is a pretty cool, upbeat tune that will keep the adrenaline flowing, and all the voices have a really cool echo effect that really fit the theme of futuristic gladiators fighting a dragon. Once you start playing this table, it may not be obvious what to do at first, but given a little time, it all becomes clear. Shooting the hole on the right side of the table will start a game mode where the instructions are clearly spoken aloud, accompanied by plenty of flashing lights indicating what to aim for. Once the mode is over, shoot the hole again to start another mode. One of the coolest features on the table is the catapult habit trail, which can be gotten to simply by hitting the ramp. During the times when you're attacking the dragon, the catapult can be seen moving back and forth. And with a properly timed shot to the ramp, the catapult will drop the ball into a hole, scoring some big points. It's one of those shots that's always fun to go for because of the timing involved. The only gripe I really have with this table is the under flipper abyss shot. I'm not sure how well this works in the real table, but in the simulated version, the ball almost always enters too fast, skipping over the abyss hole itself if the shot was made. I'm not sure if I'm doing it wrong, or if there's some sort of flaw here, but regardless of that, this is still an extremely fun table to play. <laughs> Number 4, Cactus Jacks. This table is one of the reasons I'm going to be playing the pinball arcade tables for a bit before putting out a gameplay video. When I first played Cactus Jacks as I did in my video, I thought it was fun, but I really didn't have a clue what was going on. 
Shortly after I made the video, I figured this table out and it became much more fun to play. And it's so simple in its objective that I'm almost embarrassed I didn't figure it out earlier. Basically, Cactus Jack's is a venue of some sort where the titular character, Cactus Jack, and his band play music. However, the crowd gets rowdy whenever Cactus Jack decides to play polka, which is fairly often. The game starts a two-ball multi-ball, and you try to hit the targets and ramps to throw fruit at Cactus Jack and his band. This lasts as long as multi-ball lasts. The type of fruit is upgraded by hitting the required drop targets on the left side of the table. There's a little bit more to it than that, but that's basically the core of the game. Sure, it's simple, but it's incredibly fun, and to add to the absurdity of it all is Cactus Jack spouting out phrases such as It's polka time! And surprise, Tendo Foot! This may actually be my favorite Gottlieb table of all time. Number 3, Swords of Fury. First of all, right off the bat, I have to say the audio and music in this table are fantastic. To me, great music and audio really adds an extra element of awesome to tables, and it really adds to the theme of the table here of the fantasy setting this table is set in. Especially the music, which jumps into a kick-ass upbeat tune whenever multiball is engaged. Now, it's not as good as a table like Black Knight 2000, but it's still great and a good reason to play the table just to hear it. The voice in this table have a great deep echoey effect and combined with the music really puts you in the setting of an 80s fantasy epic. As for the table layout itself, it does a great job of trying something really unique and it works very well. It's usually very easy to keep the ball in play and doesn't seem to have any cheap drains where you just feel helpless as you lose the ball. The standout feature in this table is the magic mini play field that you get to play with as soon as you launch the ball. With one flipper you attempt to knock down each of the five drop down targets for extra points and the more you accomplish it, the more difficult it becomes on subsequent tries. It's never a problem to get the ball to the mini play field either as there are two different shots that will lead there. The real challenge is going for the jackpot during multiball as it involves getting the ball to the mini play field and hitting a moving drop target and it's actually a bit harder than it sounds as you've got to keep at least one of the other balls in play and missing too many times will likely result in the ball exiting the mini play field only to have to try again. It's a challenge like that that I enjoy and combined with the fun layout and awesome sound and music I just had to put this rather high on the list. Number 2, Indianapolis 500. I originally had this one lower on the list, but when I was playing this again, I immediately had to bump it up. As I started to play it again, I was realizing that this table had a lot of things that I really liked in pinball. This is a rather fast paced table with a lot of shots to make and a lot of different game modes that give you a reason to hit them all. I like how there are two shots that can be made to feed the ball to the upper flipper in an attempt to hit the turbo shot. The audio for the table sounds great and really impresses the illusion that you are in an Indianapolis 500 race and it makes the game seem just a bit faster than it actually is. Add that to the constant commentary and you are rarely in a situation where you don't know what your status is or what to shoot for. One of my favorite things about this table is it doesn't take itself too seriously either as one of the game modes has you taking a wrong turn and you can find your car out in the middle of rush hour traffic or in line at a drive thru my only gripe with this table is that it sometimes can be too fast and it can be very difficult to make the turbo shot sometimes. Unfortunately, I've never played the real version of this table, so I don't know how accurate that shot is in this simulated version, but I'd wager it's not very accurate. Despite this, it doesn't ruin the table for me and I have no hesitation putting this at my number two spot. We're ready for multiball and here we go. Jackpot. Jackpot. Number one, Doctor Who. 
When I started working on this list, the first thing I did was put Doctor Who in the number one spot. In real life, the Doctor Who table has always been one of my favorites, and it might be my third favorite table overall. I used to play this table all the time in my local arcade as a kid, and that was before I even knew that Doctor Who was even a thing. Now I'm a fan of the classic episodes, and I like this table even more. It gets so many things right for the theme of this show, and presents it like it's its own story where the Master and the Daleks are attempting to get the Doctor in all of his incarnations. Well, his first seven incarnations, since that's how many Doctors there were at the time. Selecting and playing as the different Doctors award different bonuses, and I like the little details at the end of each ball, like it's an ending an episode, and the next ball is the next part of the story. But I haven't even talked about the thing I like most about this table, and that's the Time Expander. This was something that blew my mind the first time I saw it in the arcade. First, lock two balls into positions by the seventh Doctor and his companion, Ace, and the platform rises, revealing several standing targets. Hit those standing targets enough times, and the platform rises again, revealing three Daleks. Hitting one Dalek will start multiball mode, and it's this multiball mode I really enjoy because you're constantly trying to hit each of the three Daleks while trying to keep all the balls in play. I never get tired of hearing the Daleks threatening the Doctor and their screams when they are defeated. The only slight downside to this table is the video mode. I think it does get played a bit too often, but completing it a few times will offer up some numerous sequences. Not to mention that they bothered to show whichever Doctor you happen to be playing as during the sequence. I could go on for quite a bit longer about this table, but I won't. This was one of my favorites in the arcade, and it's certainly my favorite for Season 6. And that finishes up the 12 tables constituting Season 6 of the Pinball Arcade. See y'all next time.